Welcome everyone to the second day of Phoenix Virtual Investor Connect. Thank you for joining us again and for participating in the 193 Investor Connect meetings that have already taken place so far. I'm Katie Cottrell from Phoenix Capital and on to our topic today. Today's panel topic is impact assessment frameworks, uncovering greenwashing and strengthening your proposition. As impact investing becomes more mainstream, so do the concerns about impact or greenwashing, which can occur when a company or fund make impact focused claims without being able to demonstrate positive social or environmental impact. In this panel today, we will hear how to identify and combat impact washing to keep propositions strong in an increasingly busy market. To break this down, we will focus on a few topics. Intentionality, followed by impact measurement, two key pillars of impact investing. And then finally, we'll take an industry outlook and see what initiatives are out there now that are helping us all to avoid greenwashing. Before I introduce the panelists, we would like the audience to participate in the first poll, which should appear on your screen now. The question is, in the market of sustainable investments, how prevalent do you believe greenwashing to be among asset managers and security issuers? You have three options to choose for, for your answers, which can either be A, very prevalent, B, somewhat prevalent, or C, not prevalent. Now, let's introduce the panelists. We are lucky to be joined by three panelists with different perspectives today. Silva Desalen who is Stafford's ESG director. And previously she worked for Rubico where she was responsible for ESG integration and the implementation of ESG engagement across different private equity programs. We're also joined by Marcelo Jordan, who specializes in responsible investments and works for the World Bank Pension Fund as a senior ESG specialist. And finally, we are joined by Jake Otto, who's an investment specialist at Wellington Management, where he is responsible for the global bond and global impact bond suite of investment approaches. Amongst other achievements, he has worked to establish Wellington's framework for assessing impact in fixed income markets. Please all panelists feel free to elaborate on these brief introductions and provide more context as we get into the discussion later. So let's start with our first topic of conversation, intentionality, one of the key pillars of impact investing. And I'd like to kick it off with Marcelo. What do you take into consideration to determine the impact intentions of a fund and distinguish between those that are genuine from those that are perhaps greenwashing? Hi, Katie. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this panel. I'm very happy to be here and to share some of our experiences in conducting due diligence on different impact investing funds, as well as in terms of leveraging the experience that we have as a multilateral development organization in aiming for uh, creating impact across uh, the, the developing world. Um, I would like to mention that, uh, or actually pick up from what you said. I mean, you said that intentionality and impact measurement are very crucial, right? So in my experience, intentionality means having a very clear understanding of where we are starting from, having a very clear understanding of our baseline or baseline scenario, uh, to the extent that we can identify key performance indicators, key metrics that can describe uh, very objectively where we, our starting, uh, our, our um, baseline, our starting point, that is very crucial. And then, in terms of uh, impact measurement, um, I think it's very crucial to have a very well developed and thought through um, theory of change. So the theory of change would have to spell out um, whether the, uh, actually should work backwards, right? So we should look first at the impact we are trying to achieve. So that's looking at the long term, um, moving backwards one step, we will look at the midterm in terms of the outcomes that are actually conducive to achieving that long-term impact. Then we, want, we go one step back, and then we would have to consider whether the outputs that are gonna be um, actually um, coalescing into the, out, uh, the outcomes that we were, we were talking about in the midterm. In the midterm. So uh, uh, the outputs would be short-term um, uh, results that we can consider. 
that are going to be conforming the um, midterm um, uh, outcomes and which in turn will be conducive to the long term uh, impact. And then to achieve those short term um, outputs, we need to consider what are going to be the uh, um, activities. And for undertaking those activities, we need to have clarity on what are going to be the inputs to um, enable those activities. So that train of thought has to be very clearly um, defined, very clearly spelled out. So just to summarize, it would be impact, um, out, uh, outcomes, outputs, then we want to um, uh, uh, inputs and then, uh, uh, sorry, activities and then inputs. I hope that was clear and I'm happy to elaborate further as we move on to this, into the discussion. Yeah, I think that's very clear. I think it makes sense that you're looking, okay, if this fund manager has the intention to achieve impact, do they have the pathway to do so, which is really what you're looking for. And, and, and Silva, how does that compare with uh, maybe your approach? And just to add on, how might you perceive the intentions of a large traditional manager moving into the impact space with a new vehicle? Well, thank you for the question, Katie, and thank you for uh, having me. Welcome to everybody who is attending this session. Um, I think in general, there's a lot to say about um, well, you, you, you put the green washing in the title, but there's a lot of rainbow washing and SDG washing by now for a number of reasons. Uh, and it's not just with impact funds, impact products, but also with ESG and sustainable uh, products. And that's why I think managers on the one side need to be very transparent about their strategies approaches, investment objectives, and the investors, the asset owners need to ask the right and tough questions through the due diligence and later on when, um, if and after they've made the investment about the strategy um, components and intended outcomes and objectives. And if we look at um, who's offering impact funds, um, we can distinguish well, two types of managers, you could say. Uh, impact specialists that only provide uh, products with specific outcome and impact objectives and what you call mainstream managers, which might have one impact strategy or one impact product. We have seen the same with ESG and sustainable funds in the past. You know, you had mainstream managers that had one sustainable fund, but what happened there is that they started integrating ESG information across all products. They started to become active investors through voting and engagement and so on across all strategy, which is different with impact because you either have those impact objectives or not, and you can have them only in a specific strategy and not across. And of course, every investment will have an economic impact or either positive or negative, environmental or social, but we are looking at investments with specific positive uh, well, expected outcomes and an impact in this case. And I mean, is one better than the other, like one group uh, of products uh, better than the other? I think that different managers serve different um, target groups, investor groups. For example, in private equity, where we've been looking now for, I think, since 2004, um, you have a, a num you had a number of uh, large uh, buyout houses that, um, responded to the increased investor demand for impact products by offering uh, an impact fund, while the rest is just as it was. So no changes there. Um, the problem is that there are a lot of small, uh, beautiful impact specialists um, with nice products in which larger institutional investors cannot invest because of their investment restrictions and mandate restrictions. So that's why I mean by, you know, different groups serve different um, target investors. And in terms of the intentions and the fund level, they're all there. You know, if you take an impact fund of a large bio uh, firm, they will have all the, uh, the impact uh, value chain, the impact integrated throughout the investment process, the best reporting possible. They have a lot of resources typically, so they would even develop new methodologies and so on. There's nothing wrong with the intentions of the specific product. The question is, what does the manager do in the rest of its products? And if the, if the investors care about that? 
And uh, the question is also what happens if something goes wrong with that particular fund or if the, let's say, returns or impact um, uh, outcomes are not as expected. What does that mean for the future of that strategy within that firm? But let me leave it at this. Thanks, Silva. And I think I would like to pass that on straight to Jake and get your perspective on, you know, from a larger manager on this sort of comment between the specialists or the more mainstream investors. You know, coming from Wellington, which I would consider a large uh, asset manager, you know, we manage about a, a trillion dollars in, in AUM across active equities and, and active fixed income strategies. Um, I would describe you know, our approach to impact investing, you know, similar to what, um, uh, what Silva described to us there as, you know, we, we grew up um, not necessarily within uh, the, the impact investing realm, but um, Wellington is a bit unique in that we don't have a CIO structure. So all of our underlying uh, portfolio managers and investment teams have complete freedom to invest uh, according to their beliefs and their own uh, philosophy and process. Uh, and because of that, we've actually seen our portfolio management teams uh, develop their own approaches to sustainability and impact uh, over time. It's really developed organically as our portfolio managers have uh, you know, developed their own philosophies around how sustainability concepts and impact can influence long-term returns within their markets. And then of course, you know, we do exist for our clients. So uh, to the extent that our clients demand and are interested in investing for impact, you know, that's gonna be something we're, we're interested in providing a solution for. So um, I would say for us, it's kind of come from, from two different angles, but you know, the unique thing about Wellington's approach to impact is that um, we have, we, we're almost like a, a confederation of different boutiques. So we have, you know, very, um, I would say, died in the wool impact investing uh, concepts that are that are applied by managers who have a really, um, uh, you know, dedicated uh, uh, framework and belief in in impact investing, uh, which I think has gone a long way with our clients. Because I will definitely say, you know, agree with with Silva's, um, uh, uh, you know, just what she mentioned there that. You know, what clients are really interested in is understanding your commitment to impact, the motivations of the portfolio management team and the motivations of the firm. Uh, and is this uh, you know, something that the firm really believes in uh, that sustainability and impact is an important way to invest or is it, or is it um, you know, just marketing? Got it. Thanks, Jake. And um, just while you're mentioning Wellington's approach, now would be a nice time to hear a little bit about your own impact assessment framework that you've been using for fixed income. And um, maybe talk a little bit about an example of how that might review intentionality. Yeah, sure. So the way we apply our, the concept of impact investing in public fixed income markets is we have three main criteria. So those criteria are materiality, additionality, and uh, measurability. Uh, materiality is making sure that the activities we're funding are really related to one of our impact themes and we have our own proprietary impact themes. Um, the concept of additionality is making sure that that activity is going above and beyond the status quo of you know what is ex what is already happening in in a given industry. Um, and, and it also means it needs to be going above and beyond what's required by local regulation. You know, we're looking to supply capital to activities that are serving underserved populations or making a particular uh, service or, or product much more uh, efficient. Uh, and so we're really looking to be able to measure that. And you know, when we talk about the concept of um, intentionality in public fixed income markets, we tend to think about the intentionality lying on the shoulders of the investor. So really making sure that we're investing for those, that concept of additionality and making sure that that's present uh, as investors. Because when it kind of comes down to it, when we look at uh, funding, let's say an activity, uh, you know, we've invested in um, 
uh, um, water and sanitation companies that supply underserved markets in, in rural areas in, in emerging markets. Um, with, the, with the impact thesis being there that good access to clean water and sanitation service, services can lead to better health and, and you know, socioeconomic outcomes in those communities over time. Now, whether those companies are taking on those activities because they make good business sense or because of more altruistic reasons, we're almost agnostic to that. Now, oftentimes they do come hand in hand, but what we're really focused on is, is that activity going to continue into the future? Is the company committed to uh, serving those communities? Do they provide good reporting on the outcomes that we're looking for as impact investors to, to, to be able to see the impact that they're making? Uh, and we're able to hold them accountable to those things through engagements and through the meetings that we have with those companies. Great, thank you, Jake. That's really interesting to hear that yeah, you're not necessarily, you're more taking your own um, responsibility to make sure those things follow through and not perhaps looking at their in intention as an issuer of a project. And, and just quickly, we've had the poll result in for the question, which was how prevalent does the audience think greenwashing to be among asset managers and security issues? Um, and 29% voted very prevalent with, and 57 somewhat prevalent, so only 14 not prevalent. So I think, yeah, we're talking about the right thing today. So that's good. Um, and then on to our second key topics, measurement and reporting. So clearly uh, evidence of impact achievement demonstrated through measurement and reporting is important to determine and support the attention, the intention of a potential investee. So let's start maybe with Marcelo again. What kind of measurements best support an intention? What, are you, what evidence are you really looking for there? When it comes to evidence, I think it's important to have a very well and strong, a very strong actually um, impact reporting framework. So we like to see that there are like uh, uh, very formal reporting mechanisms um, and measurement mechanisms. Um, I mentioned the theory of change. I think we like to see that uh, in, our, in, in, in the underlying impact investing framework in general. And that is gonna be the basis for a very strong uh, impact reporting. Um, <clears throat> so um, evidence will be basically, uh, from our perspective, is gonna be relating to the traceability of the impact. So how can we actually make sure that the impact that is being achieved can be attributable to the, the inputs across the, you know, the uh, impact value chain that I mentioned, um, to the inputs, to the investments that were um, committed by the fund. So that, that linkage between inputs all the way down to impact and the traceability, the, the, the ability for us as an investor to, to be able to um, track, track down all these um, different steps in the value chain, um, the impact value chain, as we call it, it would be very important to, to have um, enough reassurance on the um, attribution of the impact. Silver, is that something similar for you, or do you look at something different when you want to see the, you know, the evidence through measuring and reporting, or any particular frameworks that you like to see there? Well, you you have to imagine that we're investing primarily through funds uh, across different um, asset classes, and. Uh, well, we've been doing that for, well, for some of them 20 years on the sustainable, which could, would probably now be called the uh, uh, impact side um, for 16 years. Uh, and um, if, if we want to assess the impact of our portfolios, it's, uh, well, across the strategies and across the funds, it's almost impossible. Um, you know, we, of course, there are frameworks out there, fortunately, um, and there are initiatives. But if I look at what we receive from uh, our managers, um, you know, everybody reports differently or about, I think, two thirds do not report on, on impact of their investments. Uh, so uh, what we get is uh, some what are called impact reports, reports on the positive contribution nowadays uh, to the, the SDGs. So SDGs have become an important framework. Um, but uh, on, the, on the negative impact side, we would uh, 
maybe get some ESG like reporting with some, um, let's say, uh, environmental footprints of, of the underlying investment. So um, if, if you're investing indirectly in uh, through funds, you're facing actually a lot of a lot of challenges if you want to put uh, or if you want to present or provide insight into the um, impact of your portfolio, despite the, the frameworks. And I mean, we will probably mention some of them later as well, like uh, IRIS, uh, there, are, there are all kinds of principles and standards and uh, initiatives out there. Uh, but given the diversity of the reports, given the lack of standardization still, uh, it makes it very difficult for, um, I think, asset owners, but also fund of funds, uh, to um, well report <laughs> report across asset classes and across strategies. Mm -hmm. You mentioned a lot of the time the impact reports that you do receive are uh, showing positive contribution and not so much negative. How how is that useful? Do you need the neutral and negative impacts um, caused by the fund as well to consider investment? Yeah, I mean. Ideally, once you have made an investment, ideally you would uh, want to have information or data on net impact of investments. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we do our best in, in due diligence in terms of assessing the potential um, um, impact of investments. And you have to know that within Stafford, we largely invest in secondary funds, which additionally complicates some of the things, but in terms of assessing the potential out, um, let's say impact of the underlying assets and companies, you can do something. So ideally we will have net impact, but as I mentioned before, what we get is very limited. The information we get from the managers because we don't have detailed information on the underlying assets and, and portfolio companies. So we have, I think about one third of our managers reports on contribution to let's say sustainable development goals nowadays, about two thirds report on their negative impact, what I call the, like the negative footprints before, but there's nobody at this moment that provides net impact. It's not that, uh, well, the, the investors, the managers don't want to do that. It's just that it's very complex and, um, and difficult. Uh, so the, there are a number of uh, challenges with how to do that. And I've seen the solutions, uh, you know, through monetizing the, the value of the outcomes and impacts, uh, because then you can sort of, you know, net the positives and the negatives. But the issue uh, I think we're facing there is that you get some sort of black box <laughs> that uh, uh, delivers some kind of result. Uh, which is a positive or, or a negative number, but you don't know what happens there. So it's quite complex. You need to have a specialist or a separate team that can do that. Uh, so I think I'm afraid for the time being, we, we have to uh, deal with, uh, or we'll have to do with capturing the negative impacts uh, through the, let's say ESG-like uh, reporting and ESG risk management. Uh, and monitoring and um, with the reporting on uh, positive outcomes and impact where possible uh, and, and where we can actually get it from the managers. And sometimes that will only be the qualitative um, analysis and assessment. I think I'm afraid that's where we are at, at the moment. And I'm talking about, you know, when you're investing across <laughs> asset classes and across managers. If you, you know, the closer you are to a single investment to a project and a project level, you can do that. But the further away in the investment chain you are, the more complex it gets to, to aggregate and to summarize and to present this in a way that makes sense. Katie, I don't know if I can add something to what Please I said before. Yeah, uh, thank you. So probably just for um, further clarity on our own approach. And also um, I'm now uh, recalling what we did with some clients, World Bank clients, which we assisted in terms of developing their own impact investment frameworks. So an investment framework per se, from our point of view, 
has different components, right? The um, intentionality component, which uh, I think um, Jake also touched on in terms of additionality, and that's what I refer to as the baseline scenario, defining very well the baseline scenario. Um, the um, principles that we're gonna um, um, guide the impact investing framework. And a very crucial component is the impact reporting framework, right? So it's another component in our view of an, of an impact investing framework. And when it comes to impact reporting framework, I think one of the key issues to look at are, for example, where is the data um, coming from? How is it being captured? Who is responsible for capturing that data? What's the um, frequency, the timing for capturing that data? And is that data um, auditable, for example? Uh, what are the sources? Uh, is it um, you know, something that can be um, relied on? Is it a timely collection of data. So all these elements um, play a role in terms of defining a robust um, impact reporting framework. I just wanted to add that. Thanks. And and Jake, I saw you nodding along earlier when Silver was talking through about some of those challenges and including the monetizing outcomes. Are, are these, do these feel quite familiar? A lot of these challenges and you know, sort of headaches that people are mentioning here, Silva and, and Marcel have have identified, I definitely feel them. Um, and uh, these are things that that we are thinking about a lot. So just in, in terms of negative externalities uh, and impact risks, um, we talk a lot about that. Um, we consider negative externalities with every impact investment that we make, but you know, as Silva was alluding to, sometimes it's really difficult to measure the sort of offset of a negative externality related to the, your positive impact, because they can be com in completely, totally different spheres. You know, one could be, in a, you could be investing for an environmental impact, but you could be having a social negative externality. And how do you, how do you compare those two things in an apples to, to apples way? Um, but the way we've addressed that is sort of taken a hard line on and on negative externalities and said that if there are material negative externalities that we're exposed to by investing in a particular opportunity, we're just, we're not going to invest. We would, we prefer to avoid those uh, material uh, exposures to negative externalities, but, you know, they definitely arise. You know, I can tell you about a, a green bond we were looking at that was oriented towards um, providing um, education and job training for certain uh, communities. But the industry that those job trainings were supporting was uh, related to the energy sector, which is heavily reliant on fossil fuels in that area. So we were like, well, is that really an activity we wanna be supporting? Maybe not. So that's the type of decisions we have to be making. And then in terms of how we report these decisions that we're making to clients, you know, I really echo Marcelo and, and Silva's points that at this point, um, tough to do in a quantifiable way, but we think that we're, we're moving towards a model where we're reporting more about risks um, in a qualitative way in our impact reporting. Um, we really like the uh, impact management project, uh, five dimensions of impact. And one of those five dimensions is risk so, um, you know, identifying uh, the risk associated with the impact activity either not being achieved or, or potential negative externalities. Around. Yeah, that's great to hear an example as well. Clearly, all, if not just most investments have trade-offs. So there has to be a way to be able to consider these negative externalities and risks. And just quickly, while we have sort of mentioned a little bit about additionality, particularly with Marcelo, we've had a question in um, on how do you look at additionality for public assets? asset classes. Don't know who wants to take that one. I can briefly mention that um, it's very, of course, it's very, um, it's very difficult and challenging to, to attribute, right, um, impact on, on a public um, listed company. However, we see some activist um, investors who will take a majority stake in a company. And therefore, in those cases, it's going to be probably easier to try to attribute um, certain impact. Uh, on the other hand, um, even if that's not the case, um, 
it depends also how, how you are defining your impact objective, right? If your impact objective is kind of like a long-term perspective and the company is going to play a role in achieving that long-term impact, maybe there is a way to connect both and, and have that um, figured out in your impact value chain. Thank you. And we also have another poll coming up now, which is how can the UN SDGs be used for assessing the impact of investments? So you're, you have five choices for your answer. A, to assess impact potential of investments in due diligence. B, as a tool that can help define impact objectives and monitor their progress. C, as a reporting framework. D, to measure how sustainable investment portfolios are. Or E, not at all. And again, we'll, we'll get to that one in a few minutes. Okay, so let's take a step back away from the sort of discussed impact frameworks and more um, what all of our panelists are doing to try and avoid greenwashing and look at the industry as a whole. So Silva, maybe you can start us off here. There are a lot of fund manager or industry commitments and principles or codes of conduct out there in the market. Which of those would you look for in a fund manager? Are any of them in particular um, particularly useful in the fight against greenwashing in your perspective? Yeah, well, we have, uh, we have heard about uh, the five dimensions of impact and impact management project that, that uh, Otto has uh, mentioned. We've just had the SDGs. I mean, SDGs as some sort of framework that can serve as a reporting framework or communication tool. But um, I mean, public commitment to any specific impact principles or standards I see as an um, um, additional sign of, uh, well, credibility and accountability for uh, investors or for managers that are active in, in impact space. Potentially these or such standards or codes can also contribute to the standardization of impact management and measurement which which would eventually facilitate the growth of the impact investing uh, and its uh, relevance um, however i mean having said that we see well we would all like to have one standard and we strive for standardization but we see an increasing number of different initiatives um, and codes um, and um, for example we have the operating principles for impact management with the aim to bring greater discipline and transparency into um, the impact investing market, requiring annual disclosure, independent verification, and so on. The SDG impact standards as uh, launched uh, by the UN Development Program, uh, impact management project, impact reporting and investment standards, and, uh, and so on. So, um, you know, just to, to uh, emphasize again, any commitment to this and the application of, of uh, principles and standards is, uh, is an indication that uh, a manager and investor is serious, tries to be credible and accountable for how, and, uh, how they invest, where they invest and how they report on that. Uh, but I'm afraid that similar to... Um, well, as what we've done in ESG and in other areas, we just cannot agree on, uh, on one set of um, either reporting standards or uh, principles on how we want to do that. I, I see it as kind of fragmented, a lot of fragmented uh, in initiatives, uh, but I'm hopeful. Let me leave it at that. Thanks. And Jake, you already mentioned earlier that um, you're using the IMPs, five dimensions as a framework. Are there any other kind of principles, codes of conduct, commitments, all these kind of things, frameworks that are um, particularly useful to you? And probably just to add on to that, how do you think initiatives such as the EU eco label, taxonomies and the sustainable finance disclosure regulation, how do you think they will come in and help? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I can kind of answer your your question in one or multi part question in one big response. Yeah. You know, I think I think that ultimately all of these regulations and taxonomies and and, and tools that are being made uh, to impact investors are going to create more confidence and transparency for end investors in this space. 
-hmm. That's ultimately where I what I believe all of this is in service of. And I, I think um, I've been encouraged by what we're seeing. And, you know, specifically, we've been doing a lot of work to understand where products within our um, sustainability lineup fit within the uh, EU um, regulatory um, frameworks that we see coming out. So the the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation or, or SFDR, you know, I think that uh, coupled with uh, the EU eco label, which could be coming down the line in a few years, uh, could really help give investors confidence as sort of a baseline of, um, you know, backstop to, to greenwashing activities uh, with from a product perspective. Uh, and then there are, um, you know, other frameworks like the, the EU taxonomy, uh, which is really geared to help um, define really what is a green activity uh, and, and things like the task force on climate re related financial disclosures, uh, which helps give companies a framework and, and guidance on how to report on the, uh, you know, climate intensity of their businesses. Those are tools that we're going to be able to use as impact investors to help inform decisions on what's coming in and out of our portfolios and, and tools that investors are going to be able to use to, to hold us accountable to um, what we're putting in their portfolios. So I think all of this is, like I said, in service of you know, providing more confidence to investors and more transparency around what's going on within products. I can only echo what has been said by um, my colleagues on the panel. I could only add that um, it is important for investors, especially impact investors, um, not only those investing in emerging markets, but also you know, globally, um, to um, look into uh, what, what is the global sustainable development agenda in general. The SDGs is part of it, but it's important to understand that in a broader context, um, but also go down to national policies and priorities because the SDGs um, define a number of targets that can be implemented at, or ha have to be implemented at the national level. For that, countries are developing national sustainable development policies. And um, to the extent that an impact investor is aware of that, that will enhance their capacity not only to to make sure that the impact that is being pursued is in line with those um, SDGs. And at the end of the day, those national development uh, sustainable development policies. But at the same time, there is um, less need for validation. There's, there is uh, less need, uh, less um, need for, of, of um, you know, uh, uh, making sure that there is alignment between, for example, a specific sustainable development policy at the national level. Uh, we, uh, so in other words, I'm trying to say that the SDGs are important, but should not be taken as a standalone framework. It has to be put in the context. And usually that context is, is, is it's at the national level or at the regional level. So it's important for, for us as investors to be aware of that. Uh, we don't necessarily need to become experts in terms of national development policies, but it's important also to, to, to make sure that we understand the basics and especially the key goals, whether being those um, national development policies trying to achieve, whether the priorities and whether the um, uh, pathways towards those 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 goals. I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and yeah. and talking about the SDGs, we just had the results in for the poll. So just as a reminder, the question was: How can the UN SDGs be used um, for assessing the impact of investments? And the most popular answer was as a reporting framework. That was, that was followed by as a tool to help define impact objectives and then equal split among the other answers. So, um, Katie, can I add something? Yes. Um, in, in relation to the uh, different frameworks and codes and so on, I just wanted to emphasize that with uh, all these additional or new, um, whether it's disclosure requirements or uh, principles, the expectations towards the managers are also increasing. So nowadays you can almost not, um, I think, uh, uh, present an impact fund to an asset owner in Europe 
without making some reference to sustainable to its contribution to sustainable development goals, without uh, showing the five dimensions of uh, impact, without referring to iris metrics if you show examples of kpis and um, yeah so I, I wanted to emphasize that with, that with all these new uh, or with, with the, the codes and frameworks the expectations are also there so um, i think the the managers should uh, well of course they, they probably have that in mind but uh, it, it's it's becoming it's becoming a necessity to keep up uh, and try to be aligned with uh, these frameworks and some of the um, reporting uh, regulation uh, requirements. Yeah, this will be additional. Um, I mean, this will be additional um, work or additional uh, disclosures that the managers will be expected uh, to provide maybe uh, sometimes uh, just because the investors uh, fall under the disclosure, the asset owners. So I think, yeah, just to, 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 to summarize, the expectations are just um, increasing in this respect. Thank you. And Silva mentioned that um, it's almost necessary now to present the SDGs in Europe in a fun presentation. But how can we really tell if they're being used to, I think, rainbow wash is one of the terms, or being used to enhance the impact? Is there a way to distinguish when you see the SDGs, you know, on a, on a page, how they're being used? And that's open for anyone. I could take a stab at responding to that. You know, I think um, asking questions of the manager to uh, how they use the SDGs uh, within their process and then asking for examples about how it's incorporated uh, in the decision-making process over time is gonna really be what helps, uh, you know, I would think helps people get confident uh, in a given strategy and its credentials and using the SDGs over time. Um, you know, due diligence processes, you know, can, can sometimes take a while and especially in a new space like impact investing. Uh, for which is new for a lot of uh, investors, you know, it's it'll take some time to get comfortable. But I think, uh, you know, repeated conversations and and exam understanding and seeing how the portfolio shifts over time and how the SDGs are influencing the that process uh, can help investors gain confidence in the credentials of an impact strategy. Um, if I may add uh, a few words, uh, we've been, uh, while well, we're analyzing the kind of disclosures we're getting from our managers and with respect to SDGs, uh, we've been looking into more detail how uh, they use them. And I think I mentioned about one third of our uh, PE managers in the program make some reference to SDGs, but sometimes it's just at the fund level with a few icons, you know. So that already says enough. And there's, I think, about 17% that actually had um, uh, um, KPIs that were linked to uh, the targets behind the SDGs and uh, also provided some uh, sort of cons consistent reporting on those uh, KPIs. So this is, I think, still the, the minority of managers out there. If we look at the broader market, just not just the, the impact focused managers. So I think you, you can see pretty quickly, you know, is it just icons at the fund level or, or in the presentation somewhere on one slide, or is it seriously worked out um, through the KPIs that are being monitored and uh, that are actually linked to the specific targets that are actually meant for the um, private businesses and not the government. Thanks, Silva. And if I may, Marcelo, what out of all these frameworks and tools we currently have, what more is needed? Uh, well, I think uh, we have plenty of tools that need to actually be fully consolidated and more uh, mainstream in, in, in our, in our um, industry. Um, I, I, I don't know really. I mean, I think there is plenty to work on. Uh, we have uh, a very comprehensive global development agenda that I referred to before, and the SDGs are part of it. Um, understanding all that, understanding the implications, and probably 
something that is crucial is understanding the transition pathways towards that sustainable development goals um, and putting the impact in the context of those transition pathways. That is probably going to be uh, crucial in the next uh, few years as we move towards the um, 2030 goals. And um, to the extent that we can understand more clearly the interconnections between impact and how they bring us more in line with those transition pathways, I think that's going to be crucial. Great, thank you. And we now have some time for questions. So audience keep saying them in, we have got a couple already. So um, one, what recommendation would you give a fund manager who is starting a new impact fund tomorrow? What is the one important thing to pay attention to? That's again, open for anyone to take that. I think almost everything we have mentioned, you know, pay attention to that. Uh, to make a credible impact proposition, it starts with what Marcela said, uh, the, the theory of change and, you know, what do you want to achieve through your investments and how, um, and, and, uh, and once you have that clear, how are you going to do that? And you need to have the whole um, impact uh, value chain and an impact integrated in your investment process from, you know, screening of investments, due diligence up to reporting and, and, and exiting and beware of all these, um, well, standards and codes and expectations uh, related to that. And we've had, uh, well, we've had like one uh, one perfect manager in that respect, you know, they came uh, with the uh, uh, with the, well, fundraising their first fund in 2016, and they had their playbook based on SDGs, which were just launched like a few months before that, worked out the trends, what they're going to do, how it was incredible. <laughs> so it's possible, you know, even though it's, uh, um, I mean, it, it's complex, um, and you, you need to meet, uh, well, increasing expectations by institutional investors, I think should be mentioned. Uh, I think it's possible. And there are a lot of tools out there, uh, you know, that are publicly available that can help you. I would probably just add that, um, yeah, it's important to have a very clear investment, impact investing or impact investment thesis, right? Or what is the deal proposition and in this case it's not going to uh, be only purely financial in terms of return that you're trying to achieve but it's, it has to be also specifying what is the impact that you're trying to achieve and the next question is would you invest in that and feel happy about the impact confident that the impact is effectively taking place uh, if you can answer positively to that um, then you can start figuring out all the rest that we have talked about today Thanks for your answers. And we have another question in for Silva and Marcelo, or one of you. To what extent do you think an impact hurdle can provide evidence of intentionality and negate greenwashing? Um, should I go first? Yeah, I think that that's a really that's a really good one. And um, we had discussions with some of our managers about that. And uh, there are some, uh, I think there's an increasing the number of impact focused managers that do have an impact hurdle or impact link hurdle. And that is an additional, for me, that is an additional um, commitment to achieving impact as well as uh, financial returns, as Marcelo mentioned, because we shouldn't forget that, you know, as institutional investors managing money on behalf of institutional, other institutional investors, asset owners, we need to uh, make sure that we have financial returns in addition to the impact outcomes that we were talking about. So uh, impact hurdle is an additional com commitment and a sign of credibility, uh, but it's still um, more an exception than a rule. Uh, and I think for some managers, it's, it's a difficult the discussion uh, and uh, even then, even though their strategy is completely impact focused and they're in line with everything else, they said, well, we're still, uh, you know, we need to uh, make sure that we provide financial return um, first. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult to, to, I mean, to ask this from everybody or expect that the majority of managers will have that, I think, within five years. Um, 
And we've got another question in, how do you manage the dissonance or versus the harmony between expected and achieved impact? That could be, yeah, again, anyone take that one. I can take that one, but I also want to give space to my colleagues in the panel if they want to say something first. Go ahead, Marcelo, and then I'll follow up. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I think that's a very important question. Uh, and I think it's, it's not uncommon to face that situation where the um, expected impact will not necessarily be fully in line with the actual impact achieved on the ground. Uh, in our case, uh, and you, I'm saying this more as a matter of principle, you don't necessarily have to build a full bureaucracy around this, but in our case, that's why we look at, uh, I was mentioning that there has to be a full impact investing framework and this framework will have different elements. One of these elements is the evaluation function. So evaluation meaning that it's an ex post analysis of whether the impact was effectively achieved or not and trying to understand the reasons why it was not achieved and trying to propose the corrective actions while the um, fund in this case is, is running. Um, so I think uh, as an investor, it's not necessarily um, a yes or no situation in which if you don't achieve the impact, we are out. Rather, uh, when you invest in a fund, you are committed to the fund, right? So you're going for the long haul and you want the, the fund to succeed. So therefore, what you will be interested in is that there is a function that that ensures that these, the whenever the situation arises, there is a mechanism to understand the reasons and there is a mechanism to um, um, uh, giving you reassurance that the corrective actions will take place in a meaningful way. Um, so that's this, in, in, in essence, the, the, the function of an evaluation um, uh, system within the impact investing framework. Jake. Uh, up yeah, thanks. To you. I, I would echo some of Marcel's, Marcella's thoughts there that, um, you know, really an ex post evaluation of impact can be can be difficult uh, because a lot of times you're investing in in projects that are new um, and uh, they haven't had they haven't been going on much time and if you have a, to evaluate a long term uh, or evaluate progress towards a long term objective you know you might not want to give that um, project uh, a score so soon uh, you know we've we would prefer to uh, you know just make sure that the direction of travel is still in the right direction. You know, that the, the commitment from management uh, is not moving away from a, a, an impact activity through our ESG engagements. You know, we can help uh, influence and, and potentially make outcomes better if they're not meeting impact objectives. So, you know, that's one way we think we can help the process along the way. Um, but, you know, ultimately if there was a situation where we felt like a project or an activity was really breaking down or, or somebody's business model was shifting away from that impact activity, you know, in our portfolio, that uh, specific investment would become a candidate for sale. Uh, thanks, Jake. And while we're talking about, you know, achieved impact versus um, expected, how useful or unuseful is it to see impact measurements without the context of the quantified targets? And is that something that anyone sees often? Maybe start with either Marcelo or Silva. Um, yeah, if I, if I look at our, uh, let's say, resource efficiency focus portfolios uh, or the impact funds that position themselves as impact funds in our portfolio, um, I do not see uh, specified uh, objectives in terms of, you know, quantified uh, in, in terms of, uh, yeah, very specific numbers or uh, percentage of growth or some, some, something similar. Uh, it's also that, you know, the, these funds are, or managers have like, uh, well, I mean, with us, there are 10 to 12 years, sometimes 15 years, there would be four to six, maybe eight years in, uh, in some of the companies, so they would have time to achieve the intended impact. Of course, the assumption is that you, they, and, and then we know from the start what they want to achieve, what the target is per, per company. 
I think, uh, well, I haven't seen uh, um, such explicit objectives yet. Also, because if you're investing in, in a blind pool to, to begin with, you know, um, it, most of the uh, objectives will be um, company or project specific. And that's why I think the importance of uh, what uh, Jake and, and Marcella emphasized, uh, monitoring and evaluation through the years that you have as an investor is, is so important. Um, so may, maybe even more important than um, define some unrealistic target, uh, but to show that you are on that uh, transition uh, pathway towards the, the well intended outcomes with bumps that you might uh, face on the road because of all kinds of um, uh, situations that might, that might occur uh, over the years that you are uh, invested. Right. Thank you, Silva. Can, can, I, can just... I add a point here? I, I realize we only have like a minute or two yeah, left. Cool. I'll try to be brief. Um, one interesting thing that I've seen in the markets, uh, which is kind of related to, it's related to greenwashing. So the overall overarching theme of this uh, panel is that, um, you know, the idea about of sustainability linked bonds. So when we, one of the things we look to do in our impact portfolio is to see where we can help facilitate transitions of uh, energy and utility companies towards something that is more sustainable. Or to, and one way that we've seen companies seeking to do that is through sustainability-linked investments where they're actually just general obligations of that company, uh, but the, the payout of, of the coupons of the bonds is related to them hitting some non-financial target, re like reducing CO2 emissions to a certain level. Now, one of the things we've noticed and been wary of in that space is that so we've seen instances where those targets are not very aggressive. And, you know, while we would love to be involved in a transition, ultimately what you're funding is the general obligation of, a, of an energy company, which has exposure to things like fossil fuels. So that doesn't meet our materiality criteria. And we don't necessarily think that those targets are very uh, are aggressive enough um, and it'd be easy for them to hit them. So, that's something we've been looking out for. Thanks, Jake. And I think that's a great note to end on. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time. But thank you to all the audience for sending in your questions um, and to our panelists for these insights. It's been great to discuss some of the challenges that we're all currently facing in the market, as well as some of the tools to help sort of um, define intentionality and avoid greenwashing. So that has been great. And so thank you everyone for watching and participating. Um, please also remember to join tomorrow. We have another panel and tomorrow's discussion is impact investing within private credit, as well as attending all your Investor Connect meetings as well. Great, thank you.